I'd like to set the scene for tonight's discussions by telling you a little bit about how the gut-brain connection works, uh, how, why it exists, why it might exist, and what the implications might be for our evolving understanding of health and medical science. To begin with, I'd like to share with you a little bit about my current research. So the main question of one project I'm currently doing is, what does baby poo have to do with toddler tantrums? And no, it's nothing about an aversion to the smell or toilet training or even problems with constipation. Imagine if you could tell ahead of time which kids were more likely to go on to develop behavioural problems or mental health disorders just from the contents of their nappies. I'll circle back to this in a few minutes. So you may have heard about the gut-brain connection already, that's why you're here, the microbiome, gut health, probiotics, fermented foods. And um, I'd like to get tonight beyond those uh, sort of quick fix claims and long bows that are being drawn and to tell you a little bit about the reality of the science so far and where it might be heading. So to address these questions, I first need to tell you a little bit about the microbiome, which Andy has uh, very helpfully begun to introduce for me. So this is a set of microbial communities that live around the human body, in and around, in pretty much every nook and cranny you can think of, including the belly button. So it's not just bacteria, in fact, it's fungi and viruses as well. And an estimated 50% of all cells in the human body are microbial, not uh, just human. And more to the point, the genome of the microbiota is 150 times as complex as that of the human uh, genome. So I think this helps to explain why the sequencing of the human genome didn't solve all of our health and disease problems. So the gut microbiome is of particular interest because it's been linked to a whole range of different physiological processes way beyond the gut itself. So in particular, um, innate and acquired immunity, inflammation, infection, metabolism of course, and digestion, and uh, why we're all here tonight, brain function as well. So zooming out from these microbial communities a little bit, we've known for a while that there is this gut-brain connection, and that's pretty well established. So it's this constant bi-directional route of communication between gut and brain, brain and gut, and it's circular and interconnected, as Andy mentioned. So the gut affects the brain. So situations um, that affect the, the gut's environment, a disruption to the um, health of the gut wall, for example, or a disruption to the microbiota in the, in the gut, um, has pathophysiological consequences to the brain by inflammation, amongst other routes. And the generation of really important neurotransmitters um, that are important for mood, for example, serotonin, 90% of serotonin is actually synthesised in the gut. So the gut is really integral to um, functioning of the brain. We know that the other direction is also true, so the brain affects the gut. Situations such as stress in the brain um, affect motility and digestion, as I'm sure we've all experienced in uh, nervous times. And there are some animal studies showing that um, early life stressors in rodents, for example, separating them from their um, mums too soon, causes a disruption to the composition of the microbiome. And this can be attenuated with certain probiotics. So there's clearly a, a um, connection in both directions there. So in a nutshell, it looks a bit like this. <coughs> Intuitively, as Andy's mentioned, we have known for a long time that there's this gut-brain connection. You know, we have a gut feeling or a gut instinct. We have butterflies in the stomach. Um, but then, of course, science got involved and it got a whole lot more complicated. <laughs> And in reality, it's, it's about a million times more complicated than this. Um, so just to touch on a few examples of how the gut and the brain are connected. On the left there, we have the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is regulating um, stress processes and um, stress hormones such as cortisol circulating around the body. And that has an impact on gut functioning. In the centre there, we have the vagus nerve, which is connected from the brainstem, brainstem right down through to the diaphragm and other points in the um, gastrointestinal tract. And the, um, there are short-chain fatty acids, which are small molecule um, metabolites of bacterial metabolism that circulate around the body outside of the gut. And some of these have actually been demonstrated to cross the blood-brain barrier to get into brain tissue. There's also the enteric nervous system, which I'll let our two experts um, about that speak in, in more uh, depth in their uh, talks. And there are just there are many, many examples, but I'd just like to touch on three examples of how we know that there is this, these connections and how we're starting to tease these apart. 
So the first you may have heard of are faecal microbiota transplants, mostly done in rodents at the moment. And there have been quite clear demonstrations that when uh, faecal matter from anxious type mice are transferred into germ-free mice, which are bred without any bacteria, they then take on anxious behaviours. So there's some sort of causal relationship here. Likewise, that's been done with uh, people that have anxiety and their faecal matter being transferred into uh, germ-free animals, and likewise they uh, show that uh, those animals then become anxious. And before you make the very valid point in your mind that um, receiving faecal matter as a transplant would make anybody anxious, <laughs> they of course do have uh, control, control groups where they, the behaviour isn't changed. Uh, secondly, there is a really beautiful longitudinal follow-up study that was done in Newcastle, New South Wales, showing that um, people that have anxiety at baseline 12 years later are much more likely to also have a functional gut condition such as irritable bowel syndrome. Now this is really interesting because it's been known for a long time that there are mood and anxiety comorbidities of having irritable bowel syndrome and other gut conditions, but it's been considered that that could be just because you've got a bowel condition that makes you lose control or you, you know, it, it affects your quality of life. But the fact that you can have anxiety first and then you're much more likely to have um, a bowel condition later on shows that there's some sort of bidirectionality. They did also demonstrate that people with a IBS at the beginning of um, their study also were much more likely to have a mood disorder at the second time point, which was more expected. And then a recent study uh, at Deakin University, the SMILES trial, showed um, that it was possible to ameliorate symptoms of depression through a modified Mediterranean diet. Once again, really showing that there is this connection between what we eat, what our bugs eat, and our mood and mental health. So, at least one of those connection pathways that I mentioned between the gut and the brain, and the research focus for me in particular, is the microbiome. <coughs> And from this point of view, I think one of the key reasons, the why, as to why there is a gut-brain connection is about co-evolution. Uh, humans and microbes have a mutual dependence on each other, so it makes sense that there would be this um, bi-directional modulation between gut and brain. So as Andy mentioned, uh, microbes can affect what we eat, but they're most certainly affected by what we eat. So microbes vary in their ability to ferment or to metabolise different types of foods. And so what, uh, their, their survival is directly based on what we put into our systems, basically. So this was demonstrated through a study that showed within two days of diet change, a very quick effect from a predominantly animal-based to a plant-based diet, all the other way around, that the, there were different classes of bacteria in the gut as a result of that, um, that change. So I think this demonstrates that it's really in the bug's interest to be able to modulate um, host behaviour for feeding, for example, to ensure that they have the right, um, the right foods to survive. Now this figure on the right comes from a landmark study from a Stanford power couple, Justin and Erica Sonnenberg, who wrote, incidentally, The Good Gut, which I would highly recommend for anyone that's interested in this research further. And they fed mice a diet that was either high or low in uh, fibre, dietary fibre, over several generations. So the panel at the bottom shows the, the generations that were, were given a high fibre diet consistently, whereas the top panel shows when they were cycled between low and high fibre. And you don't really need to understand too much about what those dot, dots mean or the classes of things, but basically the longer the barcode, the more diverse uh, the bacterial environment was. So the shorter barcodes are a less diverse. Uh, set of gut bacteria. And the gut bacteria of each generation of mice changed as a result of their feeding, which is exactly what we would expect. And after one or two generations of low fibre diet, the offspring could get back a healthier, uh, more diverse gut bacteria if they were given a high fibre diet. So they were able to recover that within a couple of generations. But after three generations of low fibre feeding, the great grand offspring of those uh, mice that had been fed a low fibre diet, no matter how much high fibre uh, diet they ate, they were not able to restore the same gut bacteria that their great great grandparents had had when they were on a high fibre diet. So what, how might the introduction of highly processed uh, low fibre foods that we've had in our Western diet since the 1950s or so be affecting our health and well-being now, several generations on? 
the Sodenbergs argued that bacterial extinction could um, be in play and that this could be affecting the rise of non-communicable or Western, so-called Western diseases, which the West has very generously now exported to the rest of the world. So it's generous like that. Um, and I think the fact that mood and mental health and brain function is also disrupted when um, conditions of, of the gut are disrupted as well simply reinforces the idea that they play a critical role in health and wellbeing. So what are the implications of all this? Um, I think, amongst other things, it highlights the importance of lifestyle factors in health and disease. Dietary and factors such as well, a healthy diet and also other lifestyle factors, sleep and stress management and exercise, have all been shown um, to impact on gut microbiota. So that may help to explain why they're so important for the prevention um, and treatment of non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular disease and neurological conditions. <coughs> There's also a new frontier of psychobiotics, which are probiotic uh, treatments aimed at modulating brain function instead of gut function. And I think within my lifetime, treating uh, mental illness with sort of some sort of gut-directed therapy will become mainstream. I think it also demonstrates the truth of this adage, um, no health without mental health, and how important it is to consider mood, stress, and mental health particularly for gut conditions, but for physical health conditions more broadly. We know that in irritable bowel syndrome, for example, um, situations of stress exacerbate those symptoms. So it's really important to consider um, both ends of the spectrum when they're considering symptom management. And I think more importantly and more broadly, um, this gut-brain discussion really raises the, the idea that interdisciplinary work is super important in this field and the body needs to be considered as, this, as a system. I think probably psychiatry and psychology has considered mental health um, as something that happens above the neck for a little bit too long and really it's all connected, who knew? So in my work, as Andy mentioned, um, I'm looking mostly at child behaviour but I'm also really interested in the neurodegenerative implications of this field. So back to the pressing issue of baby poo. So for the first time in this study, which I'm presenting in Ireland in a couple of weeks' time, we found that the presence of a particular group of bacteria, um, big bacterial species in the infant gut at 12 months, significantly, to a small degree, but still, predicts the occurrence of emotional um, and behavioural problems in kids at two years. Now, this same species has been linked to um, allergic diseases, inflammatory conditions, obesity, um, and also is linked to a high fibre diet. Well, high or low fibre diet, depending on how much you've got of it. Of course, we don't expect kids to be eating a high fibre diet at 12 months, but my point is that this bacteria has broader implications than toddler behaviour alone. And again, I think it points to the interconnectedness of the human body, the gut, and the brain. If anyone's interested in reading further on this, here are just a few resources that I would recommend. The Good Gut is one of them um, by the Sonnenbergs, as I mentioned, and there are a few websites there as well. Thank you very much. <coughs>